Okay, here we go. I, I suggest at the most basic level, uh, I would like us to agree on the problem statement. And, and then I believe that there are at least two topics we could try to cover and those could be independent. You could also look at them as joint or the same topic. Uh, but with respect to current problems, I suspect there is uh, we can we can slice up the um, let's say the the current state of the world in in under, in uh, in formulating it as two problems. First, there is no separation of concerns between mempool and consensus in common BFT. Um, second of all, with without separation of concerns, the mempool could use some optimizations. So the current mempool, whether it's it's gonna whether we just kind of totally uh, Pick it out from the uh, kind of decouple it from consensus in comment. Uh, it could still use some optimizations. We've been doing some optimizations, but there's only so much we can do within the current architecture, within the current constraints of the current P2P system. Uh, so I would like to hear if maybe more accurate or more precise or more specific problem statements. I'll, I'll take notes and like please state all your all your frustrations with the mempool. We're here to listen. So that, I mean, that actually, I think you're looking at root cause there, my opinion. Um, we could conflate the block gossip stuff. I saw a really good issue today from uh, Kaysen, uh, or maybe it was from Anton, but Kaysen commented on it. Anyhow, really good issue about like how to refactor block gossip. But yeah, I think that does specify root cause. Block gossip sort of aggravates that. And I bet Zaki has 100 comments too. Okay, yeah, I mean, there, so block gossip is, uh, has like efficiency issues um, and is a scaling constraint on the system. Um, P2P is, or like mempool, like the mempool black pressure system um, is a problem because of, because it like, so like, if you are the application, what well, let me like be more precise. If you are building uh, an application using Comet BFT, the problems in block, block gossip um, d disrupt your ability to scale to like add more nodes to your network. Like let's say you want to have larger a larger number of consensus network, or you want to have larger blocks, uh, or um, you want to produce larger blocks faster. Um, these are the kind of constraints that you run into um, because of um, block gossip. What um, uh, uh, what um, uh, happens because of the current design of the mempool is that its failure modes currently are more like I uh, an end, my end users can no longer interact with their applications. Um, uh, applications that are have any sort of timing dependent uh, understanding can face non consensus level attacks um, where they are no, not able to. Uh, I as a as a applicant as like a user of the current system um, uh, may also leak easily weak uh 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 be uh like cause uh like build my application in such a way that like uh ways in which i built things like check tx actually cause uh consensus problems on nodes when load is high um uh so like the the so the like the i would i describe the like the severity of the design flaws in two in very different ways which is like block propagation is very is like very bad, uh, it, or is bad, and it like causes scaling constraints. Um, and you know these are problems. But like the problems with the mempool, um, their failure modes are far more severe, um, uh, uh, for users. The um challenge represent is that when you survey let's say application builders in Cosmos, um, to the extent that I've attempted to survey this, um, uh, no one, gen there is not generally a set of preferences about everybody wanting the same things. Um, and so the, like, the proposal of 
take the mempool. So like, what we currently have is like a system. It works robustly in um, uh, in like the common case. Um, it delivers transactions to users. Um, it has terrible failure modes, but like when it is not in one of those failure modes, um, it uh, uh, it uh, it like performs in a very robust way. Um, and so, because of like its current like this current place, like a lot of teams are like have been are like say that like this current system is like plausibly acceptable to them. It also takes a assuming reasonable amount of optimization um, is and like care is taken in the design of your system. Um, like, so like, you know, the, the proximate cause of this was uh, like uh, the bear chain test net falling over. Um, and like, to be very, very clear, like I meet, like I am, because I think this is a real problem and like we need to deal with it. I took that test net falling over as a, you know, way of like, uh, uh, continuing to motivate people to pay attention to this problem, but like as a proximate matter, like Barachain, like like uh, uh, stopped shooting themselves in the foot with a bunch of foot guns that they were shooting themselves in the foot with, um, and like the system improved dramatically. Um, and so, like the, you know, the current mempool is serving the needs of the current Barachain testnet um, reasonably well, and the current mempool has served very large applications on the scale of blockchains like Terra um, reasonably well, uh, but it also has these known flaws. Um, and so like the question is, is like, how do we escape from uh, this world where we have a thing that is has uh, a set of design flaws in it um, for which there is no, there does not, I like strongly believe there's no universal solution that will apply to every application builder um, as blockchain applications continue to scale and become like these problems will be encountered more. Um, and like, uh, you know, we shouldn't just assume because like Terra worked, um, that represents like the high side of blockchain scalability, uh, Terra was scaling aggressively, but like ideally people use blockchains at larger scales and for more important things, um, than what we were seeing in Terra. Um, Terra also didn't have a lot of like time sensitive stuff. Like it didn't have like a perp text on it um, or anything else like that. Um, so like, um, and it's, so there were like, like there's a bunch of reasons why like, just like, oh, Terra work. This is not a, uh, is not like great signal about like what we can expect for the future. Of these. Yeah, especially just with that, like the horrifying nature of the failure mode. Yeah. Okay, so anyways, that's my rant about this. Thanks, pretty appreciate it. Uh, That's a good one. Any application builders wants to wants to say anything? Uh, I, I very very much emphasize uh, empathize and want to emphasize what what uh, what Zaki just mentioned that there is no general set of preferences. It's actually one of the big reasons why the Comet team finds it so difficult to make progress because we can make progress, but we cannot get a clear signal that this is useful to anyone. And then landing big changes in production without a clear signal that yes, we will use this. We're excited. It's it's just it's we will be shooting ourselves in the foot. It's what the previous team did, and we've been trying very very hard to avoid that. So I I want to see some clear signals, or let me rephrase that. Since there can be no no very clear signals of a specific thing that we should improve, uh, I I would appreciate maybe just to hear other perspectives. Maybe we're missing something. Maybe there are specific signals that we'll be missing out. Uh, Otherwise, we can we can uh, if everyone agrees with the problem statement, uh, Sergio. One second. Uh, once we we're done with the problem, we should also spend maybe one or two minutes to see if we can actually segment the problem space and the solution space because that could actually be very very productive path forward. I understand that the SDK team would like to invest time in this. The SDK team has a much better understanding of application level performance. The Comet team has a much better understanding of the P2P level uh, kind of attacks, back pressure, uh, network topology, security, and so on. So I think the two teams could work on different designs that complement each other. And that's why I structured the meeting like this to have two more bullet points. So, but let's get back to that once once we're done with the problem. I just wanted to make sure we, we have that in mind. Sergio. Yeah, thanks, Ali. Actually, my, it was not urgent. I just wanted to say probably we, we should wait for point two. Uh, I will, you know, refrain myself from commenting now because my comment was 
now that I realize how you structured this is related to comment two, so I'll I'll basically you know keep silent for the moment. Andy. Oh, I thought you wanted to say something. Uh, cool. Anyone else wants to share any frustrations, any uh, insights on the current problem statement? Otherwise, I suggest we go into into this split. Going once, going twice. Mempool can be abused for the easy solutions. Zaki, non mempool will be ideal. Right, yeah. Okay. Just one, one last. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. I, I think my mic was uh, off. Um, I think the, the points that uh, Zachary highlighted are important. I would just want to um, bring the, the the solution. I, th I think the problem itself is one of the things we have to think about is all the different use cases that we have, right? The biggest one of the biggest challenges to support multiple different use cases, like especially in regards to throughput, right? You, you, in some instances, you might have uh, big blocks, not so fast, but in other instances, very small blocks, very fast. So the throughput in, in different applications might be different. And, and with uh, future use cases, a lot more of the, maybe that's uh, where the, the pressure for to improve this is coming from is this new use case, especially uh, gaming or deep in uh, this new use cases that we haven't had before. And this will all just in, uh, increase the pressure that we have to, to, to make this more performant. Yeah, um, there's mm -hmm. oh, just like one other uh, parameter that is like, so like maybe I could like break down what I think the like, I don't know if this is a good time, but like, I think there's an interesting question of like, I, I do have a little bit of a schema of like different ways in which people like disagree about things, like like different properties of the system that they think are good or bad. Um, and like, you know, it's like, and like there are things like, there's a lot of variable, there's so like, there's a lot of axes, there's like a high dimensional space, right? It's, um, do you want um, back pressure to be on the, or to like back pressure to appear in the system on the order of, um, the block time, or do you want a uh, back pressure to appear in the system on a sub block time basis? Um, so that's like one interesting question, right? Um, uh, another question that exists is, do you want um, uh, like the transactions that are likely to be proposed to be disseminated to all full nodes, or do you want uh, 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 like like a probable next block? Do you want the probable next block um, to be distributed to all full nodes on a, on the on an average basis, or do you want it to be distributed to all validators, or do you not want it to be distributed at all? Um, uh, and these are like these are this is like another sort of difference um, between these systems. Um, I think that there's like all of these these other things about another thing is like how um, queuing occurs. Like, so do you want um, uh, to have like strong sort of like uh, account or some other base like in order guarantees where like you're like, uh, like transactions will only be executed in a certain order or do you want to have like uh, unordered guarantees where like you're like uh, the transactions, transactions can be applied never. Do you want people to be able to uh, opt into like ordered or unordered execution? Um, those are just like some of the variables that like I think make it really hard to build like one universal solution, um, or at least these are like three or a few of the di uh, dimensions that I think. Of. To complement that, also uh, there's another case which is if you want to build a system that is resilient to uh, support the back pressure, um, identifying um, uh, if if the outlier is um, a storm attack or is just an outlier for the normal pattern. Um, how do you handle that, right? Like, uh, are there ways to do this? Not. Um, that's one of the challenges too, right?
Okay. Yeah, it sounds. Uh, I, I absolutely agree. It's high high dimensional space. It's what makes it so subtle and so difficult uh, to improve because you push something from one edge and then you figure out that you sacrificed another another part. Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, one other thing is um, one other dimension is node operator complexity and like validator operator complexity. Um, uh, is is another thing. That, like some chains want validator operations to be very simple. Validators spin up one process. Um, they have to maintain only one thing. Other other chains will like are like willing to like have validators have to do more complicated things. Have to run more complicated setups. Um, so like so, your operation complexity is another variable. To dovetail here, so like this is actually why I believe we end up with two solutions in the end. Um, the the idea of the block proposer being where trans, transactions are submitted to uh, requires a whole new layer of infrastructure. And I think like it's just going to happen. Um, you know, if we look at the way that Solana is doing it, it's pretty good. Um, and heck, even if it wasn't like built into the con repository, I figure somebody would eventually do it, but we probably should build it in and the other thing is cat, which I figure just replaces vanilla. Yeah, I have one, one thought regarding uh, operator complexity. Um, so one of the things we, we you know, came to get used to is that many of the parameters of the mempool, by the way, this is actually the comment I wanted to make before. So one of the things, the first thing we're doing with respect to this, also to address you know, the P2P stops, et cetera, is that in D1, we're gonna be trying to find um, a nicer set or a more sane set of defaults for uh, the parameters of mempool. Hernan maybe can can develop a little bit on this, but uh, this is something we're gonna do and, and ext extensively test at scale for, for D1 so that uh, you know the defaults are not the ones that we have today. So this is on slate. Uh, but my thought was, sorry, I got a bit distracted. My thought was on, on complexity. So. All these parameters today, they are set by operators. And we know that, I'm, I won't get into a particular examples now, but we know that some of those things, somehow they have to be set to same values with respect to what other operators are setting. So in some sort of readme or something, and this is kind of conventional, right? This is by convention, right? If people have to conform, if they don't conform, things don't work, we have to start troubleshooting. And so my question too, because I, I think this is a golden opportunity to ask this question, given the, all the various roles that are here in this meeting is, what do people think from the operator side, from the SDK side, from the app chain side of the current their current experience with, uh, I know that we need to improve mempools, there are other arguments, but just to, to focus the discussion, like the current mempool that we that is widely used, the vanilla one or the V0, whatever you call it, and the, their current um, parameters, what of those parameters you think would make sense maybe to maybe have like, as a consensus params exclusively, or or maybe, or, or to what extent the SDK would be actually willing to, you know, to, you know, to go with that to that solution with particular parameters, or a hybrid thing where maybe the app set something by default, and then uh, and the operator, if they know what they're doing, then can override the Arcofic Tomel. I don't know. Do you have any any insights on particular parameters for the current mempool implementation that could help in this direction? I know this is just one small part of the solution, but uh, something to I just just had this question. Yeah, that's a very practical angle to look at things. I think uh, it would be beneficial to think a bit about that because we can we can pick it from this side and then we can follow that thread to see where it leads. So uh, the, the reason I'm asking this question now is that my feeling is that whatever solution we have, if the solution you know is about having some mem some sort of mempool inside Comet, I'm not talking about other solutions which are also viable, but if we are to have something inside Comet that is to work well, whatever algorithm we have there, this algorithm will have will have some parameters, some configuration that needs to be consistent. I mean, this problem is going to happen probably no matter what algorithm or what improvements we make to to the, you know, gossing propagation or whatever. And so that's why I wanted to ask this question in terms of do people have the feeling that some of those parameters should be elsewhere or not? So um, there's this general problem um, that exists in both uh, block propagation and mempool transaction propagation, which is like the, how configuration is propagated through the system, which is like 
some new validator joins the network um and then like how is configuration um in comparison to like and like so you you we and you know there are a variety of different answers to this question that are uh um uh, that like have exi that exist in various blockchain designs, um, and so like one of the questions is is like what should there like what what data paths should exist um, uh, for propagating configuration through the system? Like uh, the social consensus data path um, is like is the what we've used in the past. It has a lot of limitations in terms of flexibility it has a lot of uh uh of uh, uh, uh limitations in terms of performance it has a lot of limitations in terms of adaptiveness um and so you know like in most ways it's probably not going to be a data path that like suits us for improving the system um but then there are like other variables that exist in these data paths like um like you know if you have configuration of this kind um you know, uh, who, like, wh how is, how are uh, changes to configuration auth authorized? Um, is there any desire, if you are, if you want to start putting network information into, um, uh, into the configuration value, like, you know, a bunch of, val like, validators are accepting transactions on these endpoints or um, stuff like that. Is there a desire to encrypt this information in some way? So do you want to have, like, secure channels uh, in the system? Uh, do you want to uh, hold the information in uh, in uh, configuration information in on chain, or do you want to have a, a distribute uh, like a distributed hash table that holds um, configuration? So these are like, so like I don't know, just like simplify to like resummarize like questions that have come up is that like whenever this happens, is you need a, a channel, uh, a, either a broadcast channel or a secure channel um, uh, to uh, uh, to propagate uh, configuration information, um, the the like an out a completely non like automated broadcast channel, which is essentially what like, like update readme is, um, is really not suitable for running any of these systems under high performance use cases. Um, so we have to move to some sort of like in band signaling mechanism, um, and like then the question is, are the is this mechanism a secure channel? And then like in the world of broadcast mechanisms. Um, like there's two plausible broadcast mechanisms. Um, one is a distributed hash table. The other one is like on chain is on the, in the atomic broadcast system itself. Um, sometimes there are advantages to both, um, uh, 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 to, or like advantages to having this. And there's like plausible hybrid systems that can be created as well. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, just thinking the the social consensus side is historically uh, what, what mostly working cosmos, but the the P two P layer being below the consensus level um, kind of like forces you to go into the social side of consensus. But uh, uh, it would be interesting to understand how others do this uh, in different, more automated ways, um, like like you're you're just exposing. I think that should be quite considered in this case and, and not only like the social consensus also uh they're always being on the side that um there's no malicious or uh anything that people want to exploit into the system but eventually um this like the social consensus might not happen in a way that everybody is collaborating with each other right What is an example actually that is using the P2P? Uh, operators have their own P2P deployment? Um, I'm, I, um, like, I believe, I'm trying to remember which, there's like, there are blockchains that are using the lib P2P DHT as like, uh, like uh, network configuration employment. I think Filecoin is doing it today. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, that's something to follow up on. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like one, and I think Ethereum makes minimal use of the lib P2P DHT right now. Um, and I've I but like, you know, but there's been a lot of proposals for 
trying right. for you know trying to improve uh this like dimension of problems by add, you know adding more support of the dht and then like i believe solana does like almost all of their signaling on chain um and that seems to work for them it's fascinating that that, that would happen uh because it's not visiting for torrents so you could yeah. You could trick you could trick nodes into telling each other different things like, hey, put mem put timeout commit one second, put timeout commit three seconds, and things things like that. Yeah, uh, I mean, one one thing you could do is like a hybrid system where you have identities for nodes um, on chain, but then like the configuration information they propagate is via the DHT. So like, you do identities via like uh, by like, like doing things on chain then. Um, so there is a similar idea that was capturing an issue. I'll I'll take five minutes after I I finish talking to to try to pull it up. Uh, that is similar to what Jackie is saying. But uh, in 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 that issue, it was actually good to was troubleshooting. So we know that there are some of those. For instance, the the one that comes to mind is timeout commit. Everybody knows if if a network you know um, configures timeout commit in an inconsistent way. Uh, that means that you're going to get round ones all, all the time, right? This is something that happened in, in previous chains in, during 2023. And so there was this issue about like, how how about when we tra you troubleshoot, you're just trying to access or, or giving some sort of anonymous, anonymous access to other nodes configuration uh, to make sure that actually that is a problem. And then basically try to contact somebody and say, hey, your, your timeout commit, uh, you know, your validator has a, a, a wrong timeout commit value or whatever value you have in, in the configuration, I don't know. so this is this is close. You know, this is like in the I think in the, in the I don't know if, if Zaki was thinking of you you were thinking of of that as a troubleshooting thing or or more like uh, the way you you set the configuration because if it is the way you set the configuration, we already have consensus params. So in what sense that would be uh, different or better or worse than consensus params if it's not for troubleshooting? No. So like what I so for instance. Um, let's say you want, okay, so like a simple param would be like, how big is your mempool? Like, what is what is the buffer size, right? Like, what is the size of the buffer? Um, uh, uh, like common question, like how does that propagate? Um, you, there are a lot of designs for mempools where validators have like a network that is just, pro is just like only validators participate in the network, like, because um, it, it depends again on how you want to do on, on your preferences in this design space of dimensionality where you want to have like a separate network just for validators, um, where, uh, transaction data is propagated. Um, and so then you, when you join the validator set, there needs to be some mechanism by which you say like, okay, send your transactions here. Um, which is like, for instance, how Solana works. Um. Like when you join the validator set, you have to publish you publish this information packet. Uh, it's like, I, you know, I on such and such IP address, I accept transaction data um, from other validators, um, uh, and you know that's part of your standard validator config. Um, so like you have these these kinds of things exist. Um, cool. So so there's definitely a few points there for us to explore. There's at least two directions. One to look at this. Uh, this external tools that could be employed, whether those will have some anonymity, uh, whether those have BFT guarantees. Um, and I also made a note of how do we, yeah, this, this is a bigger issue. I think it's to some degree, or I hope that to some degree, we can dig into that problem that there's no universal solution. Uh, I, I was trying to address that problem by saying, okay, let's just decompose the problem in two parts. There are there are two classes generally. There's high performance chains, and they're going to push it, and they're going to need they're going to be okay with top downs because they typically know what they're doing. And if they don't they don't know what they're doing, well, they're not high performance chains. Uh, the Terra, the Osmosis, the TYDX, the Vera chain, uh, many many others. Uh, and then there are chains that are just started in this one experiment. They want a baseline that will not have many foot counts or minimal, and uh, that's what I think for the company. The FT team could excel. Uh, so that's what I had in mind between uh, splitting the effort between the SDK team and the comment BFT team. And yes, this, the, the search space is immense, but we could maybe cut it down in, in these two complementary parts that there are needs for high performance chains and there are needs for more baseline uh, baseline chains. I don't know how people feel about that. And uh, I don't know if the SDK will even uh, do it because I guess you're still discussing. Best for you to, to, to jump in. Uh, 
I also want to hear counter proposals or better ideas to this. Uh, otherwise, I'm happy to jump into any of the demo. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is Luke from DYDX. Uh, most of our concerns around high performance here is around how many transactions we can actually process. And there's also a point in time in which we're, you know, inside the SDK, we're doing things that could have been done before they even got to the peer-to-peer -peer layer, right? So things like signature verification, why aren't we validating this before we even hit to peer-to-peer? -to -peer? And a lot of the work that uh, I've been working on is actually making it so that we can process things inside Cosmos in parallel. So if you get multiple transactions, you know, the actual core bits are done serially because, you know, we run an order book and we run those in serially, but a lot of other things we try and do in parallel. And a lot of our effort has been moving more and more bits out to be able to be executed in parallel. Do you feel that it's not necessary on the, on the, oh no, you did mention, uh, no, actually if I understood correctly what you've been, you're saying there is a P2P problem. It may not necessarily be the biggest because there's actually many other opportunities to improve performance, potentially even to, to reduce some of the issues that we've seen so far uh, by actually looking in the other parts of the application design and SDK design. Yeah, it, it, it's too, like two pronged, right? Things inside the SDK can be paralyzed that need to be paralyzed. And then there's things that are inside the SDK that should probably be done before they even reached the SDK, such as signature verification, right? Like, you know, signature verification is a big CPU suck. Um, and it turns out that we could be validating this before we even start, you know, passing this message on to others. Makes sense. Um... Yeah, this is a very valid point. How is this kind of more generally shared in your opinion? I guess I, I could see that you guys had some success there. I also noticed the APCI uh, parallelism. So I can see that there's a broader umbrella of techniques that you guys are trying, not only uh, related to gossip. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the uh, definitely for signature verification, making sure that transactions are you know signed by who they say they are before we start gossiping them, it's a very easy attack vector for people to just produce millions and millions of messages that with bad signatures that then just consume CPU cycles internally. Uh, and then we also gossip them along. And then, but once something is signed by who they say they are, it's a pretty easy check within the SDK to be like, is the person who they say they are match their you know public key, right? That's a much simpler check. It's a lot uh, cheaper to do. And we could be able to discard those as well. Yeah, they seem also pretty universal, uh, so easily upstreamed. And uh, are, mm -hmm. are these being upstreamed? Is is there is this work also uh, like happening and being upstreamed in the SDK? Slowly, right? Like I've I've been uh, trying to you know touch on topics within Comet about like making it so that we can parallelize work mm -hmm. that we're doing, and it, it's starting off by like making you know a client that doesn't have uh, a lock inside, so this way the application could manage the lock. Yep, yep. But I think it, some of the point that I'm trying to bring up is that the division of responsibilities for what the SDK does, uh, you know, like it's doing too much in some places like signature, signature verification and public key verification. Really, this should be happening before uh, the peer-to-peer -peer layer. Very fair, yeah. Um, do, do you do you mean in check the X when the transaction is is first inserted, for instance? No, not before even possibly the validator sees it. You can imagine Sentry nodes who their only job is to do signature verification and making sure public key matches, you know, account information. Okay. Yeah, what I meant is like the entry point for all our transactions is a normal node. It's not usually not a validator. It's just a full mm -hmm. node, not valid, not validating to full node that has its RPC open, and that's basically where the place the transaction is submitted. So I was wondering whether that would be the place to, to do this. Uh, you would be able to do it there, yes. Right, but then you have to run the full node and do everything the full node does. It doesn't allow for you to make something that um, is a very simple area like 
people, I believe people run full nodes to be able to do these check transactions, essentially filter out messages. But it means that they're writing like one application to do two very different purposes. Right. And I see people will have like anti handler stacks where, you know, the anti handler is the same for the thing that's responsible for doing the, the check and the thing that's actually for doing the uh, processing of the message. Yeah. All right. I feel like uh, we could we could dive deeper here. It sounds like there is things uh, that are pretty actionable on both the SDK and potentially on the comment team. Uh, part of it is also operators, so we could touch on documentation, I guess. Uh, do you feel like there's there's specific like comment VFT level improvements that we could add? Uh, some of this uh, division of responsibility level things. Uh, it wasn't really clear to me. Yeah, that that depends on whether. Comet would want to expose, you know, some other layer, which is allows people to look at the transaction before it even goes to the peer to peer layer and is run mm -hmm. serially, right? Like, you know, currently people who are using Comet, you know, work under this assumption that everything is being done serially, right? Like your check mm -hmm. transactions are being done serially. But mm -hmm. if you expose a different API saying, hey, this is, you know, a pre check and all pre checks mm -hmm. are executed in parallel and you have to be cognizant of that, then this would allow application developers to be like, hey, I need to use this pre-check to do all these things. And if it doesn't pass pre-check, then I know it's never going to get to peer-to-peer -peer and I can discard it. Oh, I get it. So what you are, what you are proposing is basically um, splitting our current check TX into two roles. One, which is check TX for things that are already in the system that are already being propagated but they're having a special check TX for things that are actually coming for the first time. And these checks could be different than those that we do when we already are gossiping. Is, is that a good capture of what you were trying to say? That is. Uh, okay, I'm just thinking uh, there is Alex here, so please uh, chime in on, from the SDK side, from the, from the Comet side. I don't know if that could be actually um, solved or, or addressed with a, with a flag. So, so uh, uh, opening a different mm -hmm. RPC. So like like whatever comes from the RPC, we're gonna flag it to the SDK with a special flag. Say, hey, this is coming directly from the from the wallet or from you know from the client directly. It's not coming from P2P, and that would allow uh, the SDK to implement a different logic. I don't know if that would help. That that's a low hanging fruit, by the way, from our side. And what does this from... solve exactly? The idea is that. There are certain things that we do and that we should only have to do once. Yeah. And we're repeating them many, many, many times across all nodes. Uh, like signature verification? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you can... Um, so it's like you're... you're um, you're kind of like passing the complexity to comment in terms of like adding new potentially adding a new flag whereas in the application you could easily you could easily tell if you've processed or verified a, tr a transaction before like there's actually a pr in the sdk that does signature verification caching so it's like you don't have to rerun certain validation steps if you're smart about how you process transactions but in a distributed sense, right? Like, you know, the compute power we have on a single node, you know, yeah. if I, for example, was the, uh, you know, uh, validator who is running, say, three sentry nodes and one, uh, like, validator node, the sentry mm -hmm. nodes is the things that I'd want to make sure that they would, you know, do this pre-check upfront. So this way I would be able to drop invalid transactions. And then when I forward it to the validator node, uh, what I see is that people will just run the exact same code base mm -hmm. and not like a different code base that's responsible for doing the actual business logic they care about. I can make a, I can make like a, a simple scenario. There's three nodes in a network. I'm node one, Bez node two, Sergio node three. All three of us take a thousand transactions per second. 
so I take a thousand, Sergio takes a thousand, Best takes a thousand. In, to in total, we have to process 3,000 transactions per second. My a thousand, Sergio's a thousand, Best is a thousand. But uh, with this proposal, I would only do 1,000 signature checks. Sergio does a thousand signature checks, Best does a thousand signature checks, and I trust the, two, the other 2,000 that come from Bez and from Sergio, and Sergio trusts the 1,000 that comes from me and the 1,000 that comes from Bez. Uh, does that make sense? How, how, do you, how do you reasonably ensure this trust that you speak of? Like, how do you, uh, so in the Sentry example, uh, how, do you, how do you ensure that by the time it gets to the validator, these superfluous checks were already done and verified and passed? Yeah, so in my example, I was specifically saying that, you know, a specific operator would be running all of the nodes and would set up a network structure where their validator only talks to their sentries, right? So they knew that any message that was gossiped had to go so, through the sentry first before it got to their validator. So firewalls, essentially. Something like that, yes. Yeah, like like trust trust yeah, boundaries I mean or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like you're 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 pushing the complexity somewhere, and then um, in in this example, you're you're kind of making assumptions about the topology of the network and who can talk to who. I wouldn't uh, say assumptions. Like, I would say like yeah. you know you you're structuring the network a specific way. Yeah, you're explicitly structuring it away. Um, and yeah, I guess comment could add could add a flag, and you know that the SDK or the application that's making use of the SDK can easily use these flags. So, I mean, it, it adds no complexity to the SDK really. Um, I don't personally see any drawbacks yeah. to it apart from just having to manage more flags, but yeah, makes it makes I, sense. I, I don't know what Adi thinks, but uh, from Comet BFT side, we would be willing, I think, to further explore this together with uh, DYDX and the SDK in order to come with a holistic solution. If uh, it doesn't, I mean, uh, as uh, Bill said for the SDK, I don't think it is a lot of work for for Comet. And if you can simplify people's life, why not? Yeah. Right. So some of this work would also be inside the SDK because things like the signature verification, you know, accesses an account keeper, right? The account keeper implementation is based off of like a state store that expects that it's executed serially. Right, so there would be work on SDK to make sure that things like looking up accounts could be done in parallel. Right, like oh, there's all these steps that we do before it even gets the signature verification. Like we put in the the gas meter, you know, that looks at cons consensus parameters, which requires you to look at the state store again. Right, before you even get to signature verification, we have to go through all these things that are currently executed in software that expects everything being done serially and was written as such. Mm -hmm. So like if there was uh, a state store that could be executed in parallel with the assumption that it's only being doing reads, for example. Yeah, we are already allowing that in the store V2 design. You can have multiple readers, single, the, 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 the strategy we're going for is multiple mm -hmm. readers, single writer. Yeah. I know that, you know, uh, separate from this is that eventually, uh, we have to start ordering things, right, for DYDX, uh, and we do it serially now, but like if there was a way where the right store sort of handled making sure that um, there was a way to resolve, you know, maybe conflicts, or if there was a way to uh, give the application control over, you know, who becomes the writer, at a certain point in time, and then is able to hold the right lock for a period of time until it releases it. So this way you could have many people fighting over the store doing all these reads, and as soon as one starts needing to do writes, it sort of acquires the lock until you know it wants to give it up. Um, yeah, I mean, the, we're not using locks explicitly, at least not in the current design, so... Yeah. It's conceptually a lock. Any kind of synchronization yeah. mechanism would be fine. Right. Yeah, definitely um, something to consider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with Sergio. We're we're uh, I'm, I'm quite fond of this example, and I really appreciate you bringing it forward with with quite a bit of clarity, Luke, because it's it's a pretty neat example of SDK based chains. 
that are high performance and have this very specific high performance and they are willing to take this route of additional overheads in, in complexity in operations maybe and in putting in the effort to do optimizations and you will encounter foot guns and other chains are not interested in this. So it, it kind of differentiates that, that classing that I would discuss. I naively thought that we could make the differentiation only at the common, uh, only at the P2P or there. It seems like quite a bit more subtle than that and it involves uh, outside of P2P. So. Right. I was only suggesting like a separate method specifically because, uh, you know, there could be use cases where, you know, even in a case where there aren't trust boundaries, people will want to do all this work, but they want to do it in parallel, right? And uh, a, a user who gets like these check transactions through Cosmos, um, they won't, like, they have to then handle the parallelism themselves, right? Like things like validate basic, right? Things like uh, deserializing, you know, messages, things like, you know, serializing the results. There's all these things that could be done in parallel. And if a person has the option to throw this into like this, you know, pre-check, and if the expectation is that it's always executed in parallel, uh, it's not a flag, and then people can move logic that makes sense there. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll let others speak. Really cool. in, in, technically interesting. <laughs> uh, yeah, should we get back to P2P designs? To are there other perspectives on uh, SDK level, uh, SDK having its own P2P layer and, and rolling out a more high performance uh, mempool that is specifically doing this kind of things that, that we're talking about now, where, where they're like exploring the topology, exploring uh, various uh, dependencies between the different subsystems at the SDK level and so on. Um, anything else? Yes. I'd love to talk about the peer-to-peer. -peer. I mean, like, from a practical standpoint, it doesn't make sense to have very deep graphs in any kind of peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer network. Like, uh, when we have, you know, with the power of the internet, if we expect in kind of common setups without people using sentry nodes, then you'd expect that uh, a lot of times you could get in small graphs, like full connectedness, and in, you know, medium to large graphs, you could eff effectively have everyone, you know, at most two peers away, right? So we should try and structure our graphs and or our, you know, uh, let's say gossiping or connectioning, like however we create the graph, whether it's by connections or if everyone's connected and gossip is only on certain channels, but we should try and limit the depth of however far we send messages. Yep. That's that we've been struggling a lot. I think Lazaro opened an issue where we were trying to gather uh, input from operators and from network deployments to understand topologies, like actual practical topologies that we could exploit to build a more resilient uh, or, or to exploit those topologies so that we make it make them more efficient. Let me see if I can find it and I'll just link it in there. I really like this this direction as well. Uh, yeah. Are there, yeah. Did you guys study how the IDX looks in practice? Do, do you guys have like ideas? Yeah, uh, we ran a testnet before DYDX launched, and I asked validators to set up a very specific structure, uh, and we did a structure where it was effectively, uh, you know, if you had a, a graph of like n nodes, right, you'd have square root of n clusters. Each cluster was fully connected within itself, and then each node in that cluster was then connected to every other cluster by one node, right? So you can imagine that everyone had uh, two square root n connections, and gossip was done in that manner. Uh, and even though gossip was being, you know, passed around um, a lot, and you know, gossip on the current comment implementation is based off of how many edges there are. Uh, you know, we saw both a reduction in commit timeout, right? Like, like, sorry, block processing times. Like, I think our block processing times are median was about like one point four. 1.4 or 1.5 seconds beforehand, and we got down to about one second from making this kind of change of just like being explicit in our network topology. Uh, and then the other part was that our worst block processing times improved a lot. Like they went from four plus seconds down to, you know, uh, low three, like three, 3.1, 3 3.2. 3 uh, the other part of this clustering technique was around making sure that clusters are uh, of nodes that are actually regionally close, right? Like if you look at, you know, practical 
uh, internet traffic patterns, right? You don't want to have peers who are really far away. You want to have very few of those, right? So you can gossip very cheaply if everyone's in essentially the same region, like Asia or Europe or like uh, North America. And then you, what you want to do is effectively uh, count. If you can make sure that every node gets every message within two hops, well, you're going to have one short hop, which is like something, someone in your region, and one long hop, right? So in our network, network structure, we made it so that, you know, one person who gets this transaction can pass the message to every other cluster. That's the long hop. And then every cluster itself is fully connected, which allows them to have a short hop. So that minimized our latency, like our end-to-end -end latency. Of... But it would be great if we could do this, you know, at the gossip layer instead of the um, network connection layer. Yes, yes. This is, this is a super interesting field. We haven't had the time to to look into from Comet. Like we are you know, actively working on other aspects of the system. We, I, I totally understand what you say. We looked into, into it a little bit in Q2 last year, if I remember well, Daniel was looking into that. Uh, but we, we have nothing that we were basically researching. Uh, we didn't have time, the bandwidth to, to, to you know, to reach any anything concrete. But yeah, um, and then there is the other, you know, the other um, component, which is that, uh, as, as the community knows, uh, you know, the Comet slash Tenement team tried to, you know, to improve the P2P, and that led to, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, non-working releases, and so now it's kind of a little bit kind of a. Um, you know, we kind of have a bit of afraid of of uh, making heavy changes there because of you know because that uh, that reminds us of uh, 2022. But I totally, I mean, that's just uh, psychological. We should probably um, uh, you know gauge how you know how how this priority should compare to uh, our other priorities. Yes, yeah, Sergio. My concern about having one person or having everyone connected to everybody was around um, you know there's a certain network bandwidth requirement being able to like broadcast that transaction so you imagine you're going to get like a 10 kilobyte you know transaction for some reason and now you have to send it to a thousand nodes uh you know if your input rate is you know 10 megs a second do you have 10 gigs per second of output rate that you can actually sustain right which is why this square root of nodes uh structure worked well is that you you know in this case of having a thousand node cluster you're only sending it to 30 other people. So the multiplication isn't bad. Totally yeah, agree. three. Greater than three gigabytes, you know, you're going to be spending all your CPU on sending network traffic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, as, since we're reaching the top of the hour, I want to make sure that I also have a bit of a clear idea on how would be best to uh, to proceed here. I, I was planning to try to start um, a working group, which uh, which is essentially a Slack channel that includes people that can dedicate some time to this. And we can do it either as part of community calls or within community calls, we report uh, what we're doing as, as, a, as a status report. I would appreciate having uh, someone from the SDK. I know Wes, you and Marco have been uh, piloting this working group approach uh, and you have experience to how yeah. to do it. I think Sergio, you also have experience. So we should, at minimum, have someone who has done this before in this way, uh, kind I'll of structure. I'll definitely be there. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so... I, I would suggest, just my opinion, but I would just suggest white weeklies. I think that's the, that works best. And as you said, okay. and we can report, uh, rather than having the, the full of the discussions here, we just report if, you know, to, to, to the wider community to gather feedback and to see if there are any concerns of, of the progress we made, say, in the, in the you know, in the lapse of time between between community calls. Uh, look, since you offered such such generously and very insightfully many suggestions, I'm really hoping you could also make a bit of time. It doesn't have to be every two weeks, even if it's once a month, uh, to pass some some requirements by you to 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 get your insights further. Uh, that would yeah. I would really appreciate. Also from the skip sure. team, Eric. Thanks. Uh, would really appreciate uh, Jacob with your operational insights. That would be also very cool. And we'll try to keep it light in the beginning. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't see a sense of urgency. So I don't think we need to tackle this as like, oh, the world is on fire. Uh, that may change as things progress. 
And it looks like we're not going to go into this direction where Comet does its own thing, SDK does its own thing. We may try it in a bit more holistic way or as a cross tech effort. And then when the SDK team, you, you have more certainty that you want to do and invest serious time in this and build your own P2P layer, uh, we could maybe split the working group in two and uh, focus at the SDK with its own P2P and Comet uh, with, with its own P2P. How's that sound to everyone? What's the motivation of adding peer to peer layer to SDK? I really think that this should be separated and not in the concern of SDK. Yeah, we'll let uh, Marco invest uh, uh, GP. Sorry, was the question why should the SDK concern itself over transaction gossip and dissemination? Uh, yeah, like. What's the concern of SDK of uh, doing stuff in a peer to peer layer? Um, well, naturally, that's where you that's where you have the application side mempool, right? So, kind of, it, it really ties it really ties down to um, having the application have finer grain control over how and where transactions are gossiped to, because um, the the way they're gossiped right now is really inefficient. Um, to the point where nodes get uh, transactions that they've already seen before and you spend a lot of unnecessary bandwidth sending transactions across the network. So if you have finer grain control over how and where transactions are sent, just, just as uh, you have finer grain control over how the mempool is constructed, it seems like a natural place um, for transaction dissemination to exist. Yeah, so I, I really think that transaction dissemination should be part of the Comet PFT. And if maybe some interface is missing or some information flow is required to instrument um, Comet PFT about uh, uh, transaction dissemination, then maybe this is what should be con uh, concerned here, like how we can influence Comet BFT. Uh, with regards to transaction propagation and dissemination. Because if we start like adding more and more of these layers to the uh, application level, then like either way we reach to some conflict that okay, there is something that's happening in common BFT because common BFT also have to like know about the transactions in the blocks. Uh, or we will just add more and more stuff and uh because today we are missing, let's say, um, um, I don't know, A, and tomorrow we will find that, okay, actually to make it working, we need B and then C and D and so on. Well, that's something we, we can discuss in the working group. Yep. Right. Cool. Um, all right, let's 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 wrap it up here. Uh, we, we're we're uh, a bit over time. Thanks everyone for, uh, for the patience and for sharing. I'll uh, talk to all of you on Slack. Awesome. Yeah. All right. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.